Hello, hello, hey there, hey there, and welcome in to another Achievers Exclusive. I'm Josh Ellis, Editor-in-Chief of Success Magazine, and it's my honor to be joined today by the fabulous Patrice Washington. We released her gorgeous digital cover on September 7th, and you'll find her story as well in the November-December 2021 issue of Success. She's an award-winning author, a podcaster, a transformational speaker, coach, thought leader, personality, and great friend to all of us at Success. Patrice, it's so great to be talking to you today. I'm so excited to be here, Josh. Like, this is amazing. Well, uh, it's well-deserved and long overdue. Um, so I want to start here. You are in the midst of uh, sort of a pivot in your career. And we often talk to entrepreneurs about the need to like niche down and really specialize, but you're in the process of breaking out of what was your niche. Um, tell us about um, you know, what, you, what you've been uh, going through recently in your career. Well, Josh, as you know, I've been known for over a decade now as America's money maven. And so initially my mission was just about really helping the masses shift from debt management to money mastery. I really wanted, help, wanted to help people just understand how to shift their mindset around money. You know, the busy work is good. The skill set stuff is good, but if you don't have the mindset to follow through, you'll never do it. You'll never use the budget. You'll never get the credit together, pay off the debt, all the things. And that was really good for many years as I've written books around that and appeared on a lot of TV shows and had my own radio segment on a nationally syndicated show and all that stuff. Until I woke up one day, um, actually my wake up call was on the Dr. Oz show of all places. Um, I was on the Dr. Oz show uh, a few years ago now and we were having this conversation about saving on groceries. And it was one of those still small voices that hit you that's just like, I don't wanna talk about saving on groceries anymore. Love Dr. Oz, love the concept, it was a great segment. But I'm like to really move the needle for people, I wanna share what I believe is the truth about wealth, which is more about our mindset, our beliefs, our behaviors that actually shape how we interact with money. And so having those same conversations about just, you know, budgeting and your credit score and saving on groceries to me was not the thing because it wasn't the thing that changed my life when I went from, you know, like having a seven figure business, as you know, Josh, just scraping up change in the last recession, ending up on welfare and food stamps and all those things. I had to do more than just save on groceries. And so while that is definitely a piece and it was a bit of the conversation, I just didn't want to be in that money box anymore. I didn't want to keep going on shows and keep having the same conversations about those things because the truth is in order for me to rebuild my life, there were so many other things that were going on behind the scenes. It wasn't just the surface things I kept being asked about. It's almost like, um, you know, there's, there's three levels of, uh, in my mind, of, of the kind of topics that you're talking about. There's money, which is scraping and saving on groceries. And then there's wealth, which is, you know, growing a, a nest egg and being able to live and do the kind of things you want. And then there's like greater wealth, life wealth. And that's, there's a mindset shift around that too. And, and um, um, that's, that, that really is aligned with purpose. And, and I, I feel like I sense you kind of moving in, in a much bigger direction. Yeah, I feel that. I definitely have felt that to limit the conversation to money really just negates all the other areas of our life that actually impact how we interact with our finances. And if you're not going to talk about what I call now the six pillars of wealth, right? If we're not going to address um, our, our fitness, and I don't mean just physically fit, although Josh, you know, I do have, I have the guns to back it up, but I don't mean just physically fit, but being mentally fit or our relationships personally and professionally, um, our space, how is our life set up to actually support us, our faith, what we do day in and day out for work, like all of those things have a place. And what I was finding um, is that in a lot of the shows and you know, the, the news and all those things, they just wanted the same conversation over and over again. I'm like, that's not gonna get people to the greater wealth as you, as you describe it. And so when I was having my 
my big pivot uh, going from owning a real estate and mortgage brokerage uh, back in the day, straight out of college, started that business to losing everything, like I said, in the recession and having to scrape up change and literally rebuild my life. You know, those things were not, again, they were just not enough. And I found at that time at one of my lowest moments on the bathroom floor, I don't know if anyone else listening has ever had a bathroom floor experience. This is when you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You are tired of yourself going in the same circle and the same cycles of just confusion and chaos and mess. And, um, you know, I just remember getting in the mirror, Josh, and going like, God, why me? Like, I've tried to be a good person. I try to operate integrity. I try to do everything right. So why am I here with eviction notices on my door and people coming to turn the power off? And that was the, the defining moment for me, like being on the bathroom floor crying about this um, and getting this, this revelation <laughs> to start looking up different things. And one, I found a scripture that really changed my life. It was Proverbs 17, 16. And it said, what good is money in the hands of a fool if they have no desire to seek wisdom? What good is money in the hands of a fool if they have no desire to seek wisdom? And I don't care if you, you know, uh, read the Bible, believe in the Bible, or you just take it as a really great quote. That's one of those things that hits you, right? Like, wow, have I been a fool just because I've had access to money? But was I wise? Did I really use wisdom? Or did I just have a lot of knowledge? Which is a big piece to me, this day and age, we have so much access to podcasts and these interviews and, you know, Audible and we can listen to books and we can do all the things and we can gather a lot of information, but are we using it wisely? Because wisdom is knowing how to apply what you learn. And so I realized that while I had a business degree from USC and I had done all these things, Josh, I had a lot of information, but was, was I wise? I don't know that I was that wise at that time. I was a great test taker. That, that's what I think. I was, I was a great test taker. I don't think that I was necessarily wise because I didn't know how to ask for help. I, I didn't know how to seek wise counsel at that time. Um, you, sound, you look like you have a thought, Josh. Well, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're talking about what is, what is the point of being wealthy or having money. And I want to break it down what, exactly what you're saying. What is the... Um, total goal of being wise when, when you're talking about wisdom, why, why is that uh, something that's that in, in your mind, especially at that time was worth being like the ultimate pursuit? At that time, what I really wanted was peace. And I found that using wisdom gets you closer to peace. And I think what a lot of people desire when they say, Oh, I want to make six figures or I want to make seven figures. And you know, you always have to ask, the why behind that, but why? Do you need that to be happy? Do you actually need that to cover your, your expenses or your lifestyle? You know, sometimes I, I hear people just throwing these numbers out there and it's like, okay, but, but why do you really want that? I wanna be able to retire my parents and see them not struggle anymore. I wanna be able to send my daughter to college debt free and know that she's gonna be able to start her life much further along than I was able to because I was burdened with you know, student loan debt or any number of things, whatever that looks like for you. But the other thing that I found in that bathroom way back in 2009, I'll never forget March 9, 2009, it made me start to look at the difference between, um, or it really made me look at the true definition of wealth. So I was looking at knowledge, I was looking at wisdom, but then wealth came up and I started to really dig deeply. And so on the surface, wealth means money and material possessions. That's what many of us think about when we think about wealth. But when I started to dig deeper, and I mean, if you pull up the dictionary right now, you gotta go deep, deep, deep. Don't just read the first definition. The original 12th century definition for wealth is the condition of well-being and happiness. And so for me, the pursuit of wisdom was like, how, how do I just live my life in a way so that I'm well and that I'm happy and I'm fulfilled and I'm peaceful? And at some point, how do I allow myself to be content with that and not be in this constant, relentless pursuit of more and more and more just to say I have more, not because it actually matters. 
I love that definition. It's, it's so much more holistic. Um, and so many times when people read success, you know, they come to us originally thinking about how I can make more money. And, and that's what we've always tried to, to you know, uh, point out as well is that success is, is much more than, than just, you know, an extra zero in the bank account. It, it's, it's just like, are, are you fulfilled and happy and, and are you getting as much out of life? And, and peace is, is such a big part of it. Um, because you had had that rock bottom sort of feeling, does, does that take away any fear from, from, from you now in this kind of career transition that you've been going through? I would love to say it does, but no, I still, I still have those, those moments of self-doubt. You know, I think that I've never been someone who would consider myself fearless, right? Some people are like, oh, kick fear to the side and go do all those things. Um, no, I've kind of learned to just like coexist with fear or, or cooperate with it and allow it to be more fuel and acknowledge it because to try to push it beneath the surface for what, it, it's there, right? And I don't wanna to try to stuff it down and then it's sabotage. I'd rather just acknowledge and I write out all the time. One of the exercises that I talk about in, in my latest book is called What It Versus What Is. And so when I'm feeling really fearful, I have those nagging thoughts about what if this doesn't work or you know, I'm launching things, I put out another book, my fifth book this year, I'm doing all these things. Every time you, know, you make a shift or a pivot, you should think of worst case scenarios. You should think about, okay, um, well, what if this doesn't go this way? What I've learned to allow it to help me do is just have, you know, a contingency plan. I know we want to go, oh, plan A and plan B is to make plan A work. Well, sometimes, you know, you may have the best idea in your head and then you put it out there and the market is like, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> so now how do you take what you've learned and just, pivot. So in this exercise, what I do in my journal, you know, probably every other week or so, because there's always something, I take a sheet of paper um, from my journal, I fold it over. And on one side, Josh, I write what if, and these are the things that are currently like giving me a little, you know, beating of the heart type of thing, or might have a little anxiety about. So I'll write it all out on the left side. And then on the right side, I write what is. And this is where I get to remind myself about what I have done and what I have overcome. Um, and, you know, I'm a person of faith. So maybe what I believe, like the Bible says about this situation. So I try to write that out. And usually the what is, is so much longer than the what if. And when I can get the page to be full of what is, those reminders about who I am, what I've done, the people I've served and all those things, then that usually is the thing that lets me get up from that quiet time in the morning, recharged going like, you know what, you got this. And if that happens, guess what? You can pivot and just turn it into this. And that's just how I live my life. I just, I, I've had too many lows at this point in my life to just let anything knock me out and keep me down. I'm always going to find a what is and get back up. How do those lows, um, you know, af affect the way that, that you deal with good times it, it, when, when things are growing and um, money is coming in easier. Um, how, how does it affect you positively or negatively? I would say um, a lot of the low times actually affect me more positively because I'm always looking for the lesson or the blessing. So when there is a low time or if there is something that doesn't necessarily go my way, I'm always trying to find, okay, what's the lesson? What, what am I supposed to get out of this? What am I missing? You know, this is where coaching or mentorship really comes in. I mentioned, um, you know, earlier in my life, I accomplished a lot at a really young age. So, you know, what comes with that is you think you're invincible. So I didn't know how to ask for help, you know, when the first recession was happening and all those things were going on. It never even occurred to me to go talk to someone who may have experienced a recession before or who was in my industry, but older, you know, and had gone through some, some down times or some valleys. But now when I find myself in these places, I usually go to uh, a great friend who might be in that space, have some, some knowledge or wisdom in that space. Um, I get a coach or mentorship, talk to my therapist about it. Someone's got to help Josh, but I always am trying to like process what are the lessons and what can I turn into a blessing? And I, I just, that mindset has helped 
me be more resilient, you know, every time. It, it makes the knockdown shorter and shorter. You know, when I was younger, things that might keep me in bed for a week, you know, now it might get an afternoon where I binge on Netflix, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna take me out for long periods of time. All right, one quick side road. What what's your latest Netflix binge? Oh my goodness. I was my latest, I just finished Manifest. All right. Yeah. And I and I know there's a season three. It I didn't get that. Uh Netflix only had season one and season two, but I just got sucked in. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know if I should have watched that because now I'm getting back into traveling a lot and it just feels really <laughs> nice <laughs> to have all these storylines in my head. But manifest was good to me. Um I think when people hear the last answer, they're going to be interested in the fact that you, who so many look to for um, some some guidance, you still have mentors and coaches and therapists. Um, And I'm wondering how to phrase the question exactly, but uh, is that something that you think will always be a a part of of your growth is, is turning to other people? Because... None of us ever really have it figured out. I could not see my life at this point without the support of others. Um, and I believe in investing in that support, you know, if I have to, and that's time, money, energy. Like I believe in investing in that level of support because we don't know what we don't know. Like blind spots, right? The reason we have blind spots are because we literally cannot see them. And so it takes other people being able to come in and take a look at what's going on and just, you know, give you a new idea, a new thought, a new perspective. And I really believe that one thing can change everything. Like, I don't necessarily always need someone to come in and change my entire business or change my entire marriage or my parenting style. But if they can give me one nugget, one nugget can literally change the course of your life or of that relationship or of your business. And so, uh, you know, I used to only go to therapy when I was in crisis. And then I realized that I would not be in crisis as much if I utilized therapy as maintenance. And so at this point, I talk to my therapist every other week. And if there's something that happens in my life, then we ramp it up to weekly and then we get it back down to bi-weekly. But even in my marriage, you know, I've had like any other couple that's been married almost 15 years, we've had ups and downs in our marriage. And when we've had points where it was like, hey, this can go either way here, then we invested in weekly couples therapy. But now that we've been in such a good place for several years now, it's more of like a a bi-monthly check-in with a therapist who really um, supported us at some of our harder times. But we just check in just to make sure. There's there's no way at this stage in my life that I would try to do this alone. I believe uh, that that greatness is not created in isolation that there's no way that we can do it by ourselves. And there's always someone who knows something more than you know that can be um, of support to you. And so I'm gonna have therapy until I die. (laughs) I've always found it sort of interesting since I started working at Success that the people in this genre that we're in, personal development, I guess you'd call it, tend to sort of like, not even mentioned therapy. Like it's this other thing that, you know, will I, and maybe that's because they see it as competition. I, I don't know, but mm-hmm. it's a great answer for a lot of people that, that um, is a huge part of the puzzle. Well, I have to tell you, I truly believe that you wouldn't even know who I was if I had not started to invest in therapy pretty early. And so the only reason that I really Um, even got into therapy, what what some people don't know, Josh, is I grew up feeling very, very uh, ugly and insecure. I always felt like I was the ugly duckling Um, in the family, in the circle. I was not the cute friend. And so I grew up feeling um, always a little behind or, or less than, and I really leaned into achievement because if nothing else, I had the smart one. I was the smart one or the one who could figure it out. Um, and that was just from years of growing up, uh, being told that I was the ugly one. So I don't want people to think I just made it up. I was told that by people in my family. Um, and, you know, sometimes family can be harsh and they may have thought it was a joke. But as a little kid, 
I took it seriously. And it was a big thing for me until my early 20s. And it was my now husband, then boyfriend, who was like, maybe you should talk to someone because it was really impacting our relationship in a, in a lot of ways. And I started to go to therapy when I was about 22. And therapy is where I learned that hurt people hurt people. And therapy is where I learned to adopt a new definition of forgiveness, which is um, giving up the possibility of a better past, right? So not making my story moving forward about what my family did or didn't do, or what kids teasing me at school did or didn't do, but like, you know, the past is the past. There's nothing I could go and do to rectify that. I could only go forward. And so, you know, when people hear my story about 25 being when I first made seven figures, you know, I always equate that to, I had also been in therapy for some years working through a lot of childhood trauma. And so I really believe that a lot of us think that we need another degree. We think we need another certification and we're always looking for the bigger and the better and the bolder. But the truth is some of us, um, many of us are only gonna grow to the extent that we're willing to heal. And the reason that we're not making progress, despite all the information that we may have access to, is the truth is there might be some childhood trauma that is really running the show and controlling how we see life, how we see money, how we see business, how we see opportunities. And it's not because we're not smart enough, but we have some things that we need to deal with. And so... I know for me back then that the reason I was able to show up confidently and the reason I was able to close sales and do all the things that I was doing uh, in my mid twenties was because I also had a weekly therapy appointment with someone that was helping me work on my stuff. And I've always in the fit pillar, as we talk about at redefining wealth, which is my platform, um, the fit pillar is first money is last. The fit pillar is first, because if we can't get past this, we'll never be able to actually implement all of the information that we that we hear and receive anyway. So therapy is number one in my book. It's great to hear you describe it as an investment, because the results of the therapy investment, um, it's very easy to see the connection that you got wisdom and peace out of that. And that trickled down into wealth and money. Um, and so that's very, that's exactly what you're talking about when you talk about chasing purpose, not money, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly, yeah. I, I'd love to hear some of the tactical ideas behind how someone makes that shift for themselves. Makes the shift to chase purpose, not money. Right. Yeah. Um, so first of all, it's a decision. And that again, starts in the mind. Um, you know, people will say to me, Josh, all the time, it's so easy for you to say chase purpose, not money. You have money, right? And I'm like, actually, my decision to chase purpose, not money came well beyond or well before, excuse me, I started to make money again. The decision to chase purpose, not money, I can give you a very specific story. Um, you know, what some folks don't know is that when I was in college, I was actually an intern for Steve Harvey. Uh, the now comedian, host of Family Feud, all that stuff. So I was supposed to be there for 60 days, ended up being there for two and a half years, getting hired on. It was an amazing experience. I left, started my real estate and mortgage brokerage, was doing my thing, was not thinking about ever working with Steve again in any capacity. Well, when my family and I lost everything uh, and we ended up sleeping on my brother's couch here in Atlanta, Georgia, Steve Harvey and his uh, manager at the time, Rashawn McDonald, they found out that I was there and that I was jobless and that I needed some, some help, some work. And so they invited me in and uh, they were willing to give me a job, literally just create a job because I, I technically needed it, right? I was on food stamps and all these things. And um, I went in excited and I was listening to the opportunity and it didn't sound like it had anything to do, <laughs> and I knew it didn't, but anything to do with personal finance education, which is what I really felt led and called to do. And at the time that they invited me in, I was actually a volunteer at a nonprofit here in Atlanta doing that, helping kids with personal finance education. And I loved it. I was a volunteer, zero dollars, no money coming in, on food stamps, 
and barely having enough gas to get to the middle schools to go teach the classes, but I absolutely loved it. I went in as I was driving to go meet uh, Stephen Rashawn and have this conversation, the president of the nonprofit actually called and said, hey, we have a job opportunity that's coming up and it's to be in financial management consulting where you would help people with their budget and their credit report and all this stuff. I'm like, this is a dream. When can I start? I didn't even ask how much it was, like what, how much money it would be. When can I start? They go, oh, well, the position's gonna take about nine months or so to come on, like to be ready, but we just wanted to see if you were interested. You were the first person we thought of. I'm like, nine months? I can't wait nine months or anything like that. So I go on into the into this meeting with Steve Harvey and his manager, and they're describing it. And Josh, they're like, what do you think? And I say, I can't do it. I almost like wanted to swap, like the words came out, and I was going, What is wrong with you? And Steve and true Steve Harvey fashion said, You're broke, ain't you? Like, <laughs> you're broke. What do you mean you can't? And I said, it just doesn't feel like what I'm being led to do. Like, I just, I, I don't want to come in and commit and then you guys create this space for me. And then I don't stick with it because it's not what I really feel led to do. And they looked at me like I was an alien and they're like, we're going to let you sleep on it. You can call us tomorrow. And I just could, this was an opportunity that I was giving up that I knew my family needed. We needed the money, all the things, but I just couldn't bring myself to say yes and get trapped into a scenario that I knew I would not be fulfilled in. And by that time, what I did know is that whenever I felt a lack of fulfillment, I always ended up mismanaging my finances. And I also found that as I was counseling other people, when they expressed a lack of fulfillment and what they were doing day in and day out, it gave them a rash, it, it allowed them to rationalize why they were making the financial choices they were making, even when they were not supportive of what they said they want. I saw it in myself first, earlier in my career. And then when I would help people, I would see this recurring kind of theme come up. What are some of the ways that that, you know, some of the mismanagement decisions that it led to? Oh my gosh, buying things that you don't need because like, oh, I work hard and I deserve it. So now I'm gonna go buy another pair of black shoes. Like to go where you have nowhere to go <laughs> or, you know, making the choice to, you know, buy a car that you wanna see. This wasn't necessarily mine, but I've seen it. Buying the car that you think represents where you are in life, even though what we don't know is that you're riddled in student loan debt and you really don't have any business being in a Mercedes, but you think, this is what represents me graduating from college or you know, having this job title, so I should have this car. But the truth is you're at a job that you hate. You don't really like the job, but it sounds good on paper and it's paying the bills and it's allowing you to drive around in this Mercedes that you technically still can't afford. And it just creates this little loop and this cycle. Um, I have to keep this thing that I don't like, this job I don't like because it's paying for these things that I've now, you know, suckered my way into and here I am. <laughs> and I told Steve and Rashawn no. So that was one of my big defining chase purpose, not money moments. The job did not even come on board until the next 12 months. In the meantime, what I did do was start to consult um, for other folks for the for like small business consulting or I took odd jobs. I took anything that I knew would not tie me up into something that I didn't want to do long term. So I was doing little odd jobs throughout that year until I did get the job to be the financial management consultant. Um, and so, you know, looking back, people will ask me sometimes if I felt like that was the most responsible thing. It was the thing that got me here. So I don't regret it at all. Um, it's a choice that I would make over and over again. And it's a choice that I've made at, you know, at different junctures in this stage, in this career, where people have made me offers or made me, you know, get, try to give me opportunities that look great and sound wonderful on paper, but are they in alignment with what I feel called to do at this time? And I've turned down hundreds of thousands of dollars easily just over the last five years for this same reason. Did you ever game out what your life and career might look like if you had taken the, the money in I that instance? 
I have, and it never gets here. It never gets here. Um, because when, if I would have taken that opportunity, a lot of the people who worked in the office here worked with me when I was in California in, in college. So they had a lot of like career employees and it felt like home, it felt like family. And so I could have done it and enjoyed it. And they, you know, would have taken great care of me. I don't know that I've ever would have been truly fulfilled. I don't know that I would have been really passionate. I would have been earning a paycheck, you know? But the thing I have to share um, just to kind of, you know, bring that story full circle is that I, I did not take the job. I went off and did my own thing. And, uh, you know, in 2012, I ended up publishing my first book, um, Real Money Answers College Life and Beyond. I started speaking all over the city. Me speaking at that nonprofit actually got me invited to do a lot of things outside of the nonprofit in the financial education space. I started writing for magazines about money. I started, you know, uh, getting interviewed on smaller radio shows throughout the country. And in 2014, Steve Harvey himself actually invited me back to launch my second book, which was Real Money Answers for Every Woman on the air. Um, like, hey, I see you out there doing your thing. And he invited me back. And it was supposed to be a one-time interview that turned into me doing a weekly segment for four years on the Steve Harvey Morning Show, nationally syndicated, and then his talk show. And I share that because I think that he had a greater respect for the fact that I followed my dream and I followed my heart and I pursued my purpose relentlessly versus settling for his paycheck. There's so many threads of what we've been talking about that I think relate to everyone watching this, everyone who's going to read the story. Um, one of those, you talked about sort of a, a cycle where, um, you know, we have to get the, the new pair of black shoes. We have to get the new car because it makes us look like we're successful. Like I, I always, my neighbor, my neighbor is a car salesman. And so he has to drive a nice car. Um, real estate agents, I know, you know, they have to wear a nice suit because it projects that, that they're the person to, to buy the house through. Right. Um, and, and that isn't necessarily their purpose, but, but they feel like they have to do it. So how, how does one get off of that cycle? I think that there's a real opportunity in our culture today to shift to more, um, to more of using your values to position you versus using stuff, right? Like I really feel like as a coach myself, so I'm a, a coach to women in business, right? And one of the things that I despise in, in our space, in this coaching space is that people will sell their coaching packages by strategically positioning their Chanel bags or, you know, their Gucci this or their that. And I'm on the private plane, all the things, right. As yeah. we know, that are staged in many instances these days. Um, but I'm not saying that I don't have nice things, Josh. I'm saying that I lead with the results that I can create for people. Um, especially because of the results I've obviously created in my own life versus, Hey, look at my stuff. Don't you want this stuff? Like it drives me nuts. Right. And I think that in any industry, we can separate ourselves by making our positioning more about the value that we bring to the client and the emphasis on them and what we're going to help them create in their lives versus trying to bait people in with this aspirational reality of look at my stuff. And I think that there's, there's an opportunity for that in any market. I grew a seven figure real estate business, not because I was wearing the, the baddest suit, you know, in 2003, 2004, 2005, I didn't build my business around that. I built my business around educating and helping people achieve the dream that they wanted. And so most of my clients, I would say 75% of my clients were people that were older than me. My first homes, you know, that I was a listing agent for, they were, they were professors at USC where I was a student, you know, they watched me go through school and then trusted me at 22, 23 years old because of who I was, like, because of my integrity, because if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And if I say 
look, and I'm honest if I can't, or I don't know how, or I don't think I'm the person. And I think there's an opportunity for many of us who define success beyond just money and material possessions to truly build great careers and great businesses um, you know, based on leading with purpose and not just like, oh, I got to look the part. I, I just, I just don't think it's, it's, I don't, I don't think it's worth it. It feels like selling your soul for me. I'll say that for me. It feels like if I have to do if I have to make up all this stuff to get you to like me, trust me, know me, um, give me money, give me money, right? Then you you still don't really know me, and now I have to like put on appearances. This is what I believe, Josh. I would, I don't have a desire to be a public success and a private failure. And at the end of the day, I got to go to bed with me, and I have to wake up with me. And at the end of my life, when I'm on my deathbed. I want to know that I showed up as Patrice everywhere, on camera, off camera, on stage, off stage, behind the scenes. One of the most, one of the things that I believe is the greatest compliment, and I've had several people tell me this, but especially my husband, is that I'm consistent. Not consistent that I keep doing the work, but my personality is consistent on and off the camera. You can't trick me. Like, oh, the camera's off, now I'm gonna cut up. No, <laughs> like, this is who I am on and off camera, right? Like, and, and my daughter says it and people who really know me say it and that's, that's how I wanna live my life, that it's consistent. So, you know, I, to, to have to put on a show to get people to like me or give me money, as you say, I'm just not in the business of doing that. That authenticity, um, attracts people too. I, I, I think like, because, you know, to go back to Steve Harvey came back to you because you lived in your purpose. Um, it, and I, I think that we find over and over in our lives and careers that some of the same people who were there at the beginning will come back to us, um, and, and play big parts over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think that's every, every bit it, 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 about being who we are. And, and um, I, I love what you said about being who I was called to be, or, or it's not what I'm doing. Something else is not what I'm called to do. You know, because it, the easiest thing we can be is ourselves, right? I just think it's so hard to try to put on appearances, if you will, to, to pretend to be someone else. The easiest thing that we can be is ourselves. And I think that you know, I can tell you when I first started in personal finance, I used to think that to be taken seriously, I needed to look like a banker, right? I, and I, I sought some wise counsel, Josh. I actually hired someone to help me with my image. Um, this is in the early days. And they're like, you know, you really need to wear uh, power suits because, you know, you want to be taken seriously as a woman in this space. And so you need good power suits, black, Navy, Hunter Green. So I was looking like a banker. And I, you know, um, you may not know this if, if you're just looking at me sit here, but I'm actually 5'10". So I'm a pretty tall woman, but I love tall, like really high heels too, four or five inch heels. And so, well, not since the pandemic, because I haven't needed to wear heels. But <laughs> before, I would wear really tall heels. And this person told me, you know, you're already tall. That's kind of intimidating. You might want to like, get lower heels. So then I started to wear these kitten heels as they call them. And, you know, I was speaking somewhere else with a bunch of women who were older than me. I was one of the youngest women on this panel in Chicago one time. And I came downstairs and I, I thought I nailed it in my kitten heels and my power suit. And they're like, you don't have pantyhose on. Now I'm from California. I'm like, we, it's hot. We don't really wear pantyhose. And so I go, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to have pantyhose on. And mind you, all this is happening, Josh. I'm like barely 30, right? I'm like 30, 31 or something. And I'm just trying to seek wise counsel and I'm trying to do all the things that everyone tells me. And so you look up and within six months, I look like someone 30 years older than I am because I'm trying to play this part. And so now I'm going out speaking in this one particular time, I was speaking in Atlanta um, at a college 
And I use a lot of humor in my talk. I move around a lot. I like to have a lot of fun. And so I have this power suit on, these kitten heels and these pantyhose. And you can just see the 18 to 20 year old students going, what is wrong? Like, she looks, she might be young, but I'm not sure. <laughs> They're like, I wanna like her. I think she's funny. She may be cool, but then this outfit is throwing me off. I don't know what to do. And I could feel the disconnect. And I felt like I was in a clown suit because it wasn't authentic to me. It's not who I am. I liked big jewelry. I liked high heels. I like, so now I couldn't even focus on what I came to do, which was serve the people because I'm so self-conscious about having on this costume. And that night I went on Facebook and I said, hey, if anyone needs some suits and some heels, you get a new job, you, you know, I'm gonna be at this Starbucks on this street tomorrow, um, come meet me. And do you know people showed up and took those suits off my hands and I've never gone back. I've never gone back. And when I stopped trying to be someone I wasn't, my career started to take off because my people found me. They saw me for who I am. They could accept that this is how I talk. This is who I am. This is what I look like. And if you don't like it, there's other people who teach personal finance. I don't care who you go to, go find your person. But I'm the person for someone out there. And if I put on a clown suit, I'm sorry, if I put on a costume, <laughs> they're not gonna know that I'm the person that can serve them. And that was um, when, I, when I learned too, that even though I am big on seeking wise counsel, I still have to filter out all advice just to make sure that it's in alignment with my assignment. Because even people who have wonderful advice that's worked for them, if it's not in alignment with what you were called to do, there's still gonna be a disconnect. And I, I, took, off, I took off the costume and my career has been thriving ever since. Um, and I would never go back to putting on a show to make other people happy. I gotta be able to sleep at night and look myself in the mirror. You started off that answer by, by saying that being yourself is the easiest thing, but I think for some people it's not. I, I think that um, especially if we struggle with self-doubt or self-image, self-esteem, then um, you have to fight the instinct to put on the costume. Well, and Josh, I, I can say this though. This is why I say the first pillar is the fifth pillar because this is after years of being in therapy and learning to trust myself, learning to love myself, learning to be okay with what I look like because there's no way that I could be this person without having done that work because I did not like to look in the mirror. I didn't like to smile. I didn't like myself on pictures like all of the things, and I'm talking until I was in my early 20s. So still I've been this person for a shorter amount of time than I was that person, right? And it was doing the work through therapy and learning the skills to love myself, to see myself in a better image, to see myself in a good way. And I tell you, there's still some days, Josh, where you know I have to really work through it. There's still sometimes, especially in a space where people kind of um, try to make you compete. You know, I do a lot of television or, you know, these different things and people go, oh, that person may look better because next to these other people that were casting, you know, all the things that would have taken me out, you know, 15 years ago. That would have made me feel like, oh my gosh, right? I would have just sunken into my 15 year old version of myself where I was in competition with even my closest friends. Um, but the reason the fifth pillar is first is because for many of us, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you may have been dealing with some limiting beliefs or things that people said to you that were unsupportive. Those things that, you know, when they say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Many of us remember the day that someone said something to us that crushed us on the inside at eight years old, at 12 years old, you know, five years old. And we've been carrying that around this entire time. And every time there's an opportunity to go after something or go for something or show up as yourself, we replay bits and pieces of that story. And the only reason, it's not that I've forgotten the stories, the only reason they don't 
run my life anymore is because of the work that I've done through therapy. Only reason. You know, you've talked about um, your husband, Gerald, a few times you've mentioned him. He's, um, he's also your business manager. Um, and, you know, I, he's on your podcast frequently. You talk and write about him. The same with your kids. Um, so your life and, and work are really intertwined. Um, and is that part of authenticity for you to, to um, bring all of it together? It is now, but it wasn't always. Uh, My daughter actually is the person who taught me a great lesson about being present and making sure that my family was a part of my work because I am my work. Like there's not really a big separation for me. Um, And I used to think that, you know, working from home meant I'm here, I'm present. And my daughter, when she was really young, probably second or third grade taught me that there's a difference between being present and being present. Just because you're physically present doesn't mean that you're all in and you're here. Um, And, you know, I think for many of us as parents, we may have been guilty, especially in the years of social media of, you know, the kids are telling those long stories that don't really connect, but they're just in it and they're going on and on and we're scrolling. For me, that was the night I was, she was telling a story and I was scrolling and I said, oh, uh and I smiled and she said, mommy, it's not a good story. Why are you smiling? Oh my gosh, you know, oh my gosh. And I felt really bad because I had also been on the road speaking and it's one of my first nights back. And then I wasn't even being present. I wasn't still with her. I was more consumed with what did folks say about my speech? Oh my gosh, they love me. And it was uh, some young girls that were tagging me. And I remember thinking, um, what good is it for these young ladies, you know, out wherever I have been speaking, Chicago or wherever, to think that I'm so awesome and my daughter is sitting here like my mom is not listening. And that's when I started to be more intentional about being present and involving my daughter and as much as I could, taking her with me on certain trips when it was appropriate so that she could see what I actually do. And it really started to really improve our relationship because she started to take a sense of pride. Like, wow, that like, mom, those ladies were crying or like, Did you hear what that guy said? So then when I would need to leave to go and speak, she had an understanding of what was going on. And she go, "Um, I hope everyone stands up and claps or, you know, I hope you sell all your books or, you know, any of the things. But now my daughter's 14 or she'll be 14. Yeah, any day now. And uh, she's heading into high school. And it gives me such joy to know that one, as a young woman, she knows that it's possible to have a thriving career and a thriving family and that you can not necessarily balance, but you can try to find harmony in, um, you know, in both, in in being a mom and a present mother, as well as being very attentive to your clients and to your craft and whatever you're working on. And so same with my husband over the years, just involving them more in this because they sacrifice so much you know, for me to be who I am. But I used to tell my daughter, as much as I was born to be mommy, I was also born to be America's money maven. Like I'm not just, you know that I'm not just doing this just because I literally feel like this is what I'm called to do and how I'm called to serve people. And you're gonna figure out the same call on your life and you don't want anyone to tell you that you can't do anything else but be this one title. You don't want that. So you can't want that for mommy, but we're going to figure it out. And she's been helping me figure it out for for many years now. Um, But yeah, I I talk about that in the people pillar, creating relationships that matter personally and professionally and how that has changed my life. It's made me more present and productive when I am working because I know my family doesn't hate what I do. You know what I mean? Like, I know that when I leave to to work um, and to do something, they know that when I get back home, it's all them. You turned 40 earlier this year. Um, I did. uh, Congrats. Um, (laughs) I did, thanks. We've talked over the last hour or so about, you know, the person you were in your 20s, the shift that you made, the person that you were in your 30s. Uh, you're starting a new decade. So how does it go? Where, where do you hope that um, 
you know, your contributions, what do you hope that they add up to in your forties? Where do you want to be at, at 50? Wow. You know, I have no idea what this decade holds. Um, I am committed to the vision of continuously leaning like further and further into what I feel is the call on my life, right? Like who am I supposed to serve and what does that look like? But I'm not really attached to any particular modality, right? Like I love my podcast, but if I feel led to end it tomorrow, it'll end. You know, I, I love writing books, but if Redefine Wealth for Yourself is my last book, then it was, it was my last book. Like I literally have um, no expectations of achievements because one of the things that I was addicted to for so long was achievement. Like chasing the next, like I did this, I did that. I made this happen, you know, checking off the boxes. And that's just the residual of growing up, feeling like I had to achieve to earn love. Um, and now I'm just in this like, this journey of discovery of just like, what is it like to just love myself just cause, like just for, for achieving nothing. Like, and if I do something, I'm doing it because I really, really want to, not because I think it's attached to anything for any other purpose. Um, so I've been letting go of, you know, the need to constantly achieve, which is hard for an overachiever. Um, <laughs> so that, that might take me 10 years, Josh, to just figure out and work through. Um, I've been letting go of an attachment to unnecessary numbers. So people are going to think this is really interesting as someone who's been known as a personal finance expert. But one of those numbers for me is like my credit score. Like I would make every decision based on like, but does this impact my credit score to the point where sometimes the decisions, were they wise? I don't know. You know, it's like, uh, if your score dropped 10 points, big deal. Like, what do you need your credit for? You're not, you know, you know you're not necessarily trying to go out and do anything, but I realized that I was just making like unhealthy attachments to certain numbers, whether that be the number on the scale or my credit score or just different things where I'm like, I don't want to be driven all the time by all these things. So I don't know right now, this first uh, several months of 40, I'm just out here living, Josh. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I, I was able to, to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to take a month off. Uh, didn't The full month didn't work because I still ended up having to do some work that got shifted, but like just doing more of that, like, no, more no. I think what's going to get even stronger for me in this decade is my use of the word no. Like if it doesn't fit where I am or what I like desire in this stage in my life, it's okay to say no, because what's for me will be for me. And, you know, similar to the Steve Harvey opportunity, I, it came back around four years later, bigger and better than I could have imagined, but I had to say no and release any attachment first and then allow it to come back around. Um, didn't know that, didn't have a clue that that would happen the way that it did. And I'm, I'm starting to learn that now in different ways that, um, you know, if it doesn't feel right for you, say no. And if something is supposed to be for you, if there's supposed to be something there, it will find its way back to you. It will come back around and it's happened in many ways over and over again. And I think I'm just gonna lean into more no uh, my daughter, like I said, is going to high school and I want to be, uh, you know, at every basketball game, every volleyball game. I want to do all the things. Um, I don't bake cookies, so it's not like I'm going to be the type of team mom, but I'll give rides. Um, <laughs> um, but I just really want to be super present because this time is flying by and she's my only kid and I don't want to look up and she go off to college and that's it, you know, although I've heard they come back home. That's what I've heard. Uh, We'll see, but I want to. I just want to use this time to be present, um, enjoy my family, and uh, just continue to learn and discover what makes Patrice happy. I, I'm I'm drawing parallels here in, in hearing that answer between the way that you know as we as we save, like we get older in our career, we save for retirement, and there's you know there's compound interest. And I I'm kind of hearing that same theme in just your personal understanding of yourself grow growing to to you know you know pursuing that that wisdom and that peace that we started out talking about as relates to who you are 
Um, do, do, do you feel that continuing to grow? And, and um, what, what else do you feel like you, you um, want to, to discover about yourself? I do feel like, uh, I love that parallel. I do feel, I love the, just the idea of peace compounding, right? Yeah. <laughs> like how can, I, um, how can I have more and more peace in my life? And it's true, like I'm discovering at this stage in my life too, what brings me more joy in general, because, you know, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, not the best neighborhood. Um, saw a lot of um, a lot of things that I wouldn't want my daughter to see um, now that I'm a parent. Um, everything from gang violence to drug, you know, paraphernalia to drive-bys. I, I saw it as a little kid. I'm talking before like 10, 12 years old. And so I grew up very grown. Like I just remember always being so mature that I didn't always know how to play. And a part of wanting to take the time off is just to, to reassure myself even that the world will move on, like business will still continue. You have a team, trust them, so that you can learn to play and take breaks. As young as I can remember, I always had a summer job. You know, I always was finding ways to make money. I mean, I was selling things in third grade, you guys. Like I have been very mature and very about business pretty much my whole life. And I just don't want to get to the end of my life and go, but you didn't have enough fun. So one of the themes in my house this year has been celebrate any and everything. So man, have I put on weight this year? Good thing I'm not attached to the scale because <laughs> we have been, whether it's drinks with neighbors just to celebrate any and everything, or it's, you know, my daughter's new obsession with crumble cookies. So we have been, you know, every week, what are we celebrating and going to crumble cookies and trying the new flavors and, you know, all those things. But I'm like, when I look back over my life, these are going to be the things that I remember that are going to be fun. I've spoken on, I can't tell you how many stages and sometimes I'll see pictures and I don't remember being there because that, you know, some periods in my life, I was just going from gig to gig to gig to gig doing the next thing. And sometimes, you know, someone will tag me and go, oh, when I, you know, met Patrice Washington in the elevator and I'm like, huh, let's see, let me remember the outfit. Where was that? Like, where was I, what was happening? And, you know, I love what I do and I love when I'm in it, the energy and, and the excitement and, and loving on people and supporting people. But at the end of my life, I'm gonna remember the fun I have in the car eating crumble cookies with my daughter. I, I truly believe it. Like that's what I'm gonna remember. And so I'm just trying to figure out how do I scale joy? Yeah. I figured out how to scale my business, but I, how do I scale joy? That's what I want to do this next decade and beyond. That's a great question for us all to ask ourselves. And I don't think that I can find a better ending spot than, than that one either. Patrice, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Josh. This was awesome. I appreciate you so much. Well, we are proud to have you in the magazine and as our digital cover. So everybody be on the lookout for that story and be on the lookout for the next edition of Achievers Exclusives. We'll see you then.